So um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. Uh, my name is Sarah Saduni. I am a committee officer at the Nottingham and Derby Society of Architects. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, familiar with us, um, we are a local branch of the RIBA. Uh, we run on a voluntary basis, so we are architects, chartered architects, uh, students, and generally people interested uh, in the profession. Uh, and if you would like to know more about us, um, go to our website, it is ndsa.co.uk. Uh, uh, or follow us on social media, we're on more, most platforms, um, Instagram, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, etc. Um, so tonight's event is part of an initiative uh, that we uh, started a couple of years ago, uh, and it's called Roadmap to Recognition. And the main uh, aim of the project was to provide support for people who, for architects who have um, uh, studied abroad and who are looking to convert their diplomas uh, in the UK. Uh, the and, and doing that through the ARB prescribed exams uh, and eventually uh, register with the board and um, use the title in the UK. So we, we started this initiative a couple of years ago, as I said, and we have uh, some material already on our website and our YouTube channels, uh, including articles, interviews uh, of former, um, of people who have taken the exam previously and who have passed. Um, and also we have shared on our website extracts of portfolios for you to download uh, and to have a look at. Um, so um, tonight's event uh, is part of that initiative. And uh, one important thing that I'd like to mention is that uh, we want to start a newsletter uh, in 2023. And so we are gathering emails of people who are interested uh, in this project. Um, so if you are interested and if you would like to be included and to know about the events that we are planning for 2023, uh, just go to our website, ndsa.co.uk. There is a section uh, called Roadmap to Recognition. And if you send us an email and say that you want to be included in the newsletter, then we will include you and you will hopefully receive uh, every month uh, some updates on upcoming events. Uh, so uh, tonight uh, we have with us a couple of guests, um, Luis, who is a Colombian architect and a prospective candidate for the ARB prescribed exam, who will share with us his process uh, of selecting his work for the exam uh, and of preparing the material. And uh, our other guest is Caleb Kung, uh, who will join me to uh, critically look at some of Lewis's work. And hopefully we can comment and give him some useful insight. Um, the aim is absolutely not to judge uh, his work uh, and to say if it would pass or it would fail. That's not the point. Uh, we are not um, able to provide that advice and we are not an authority um by any means uh, but we are uh, giving our opinion based on our experience with the exam and how familiar we are with the criteria so enough admin um welcome uh lewis and welcome caleb if we can start by uh caleb if you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about uh your experience with the exam and what um, and how you came to uh, start helping students to get through uh, that hurdle of the ARB prescribed exam yourself. Of course, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Lovely to be here. Uh, my name is Caleb. I am a senior design manager at Plan A Consultants. Very recently switched from uh, having practiced as an architect for about 10 years. I studied and trained as an architect uh, in, the, in the U.S., originally and started practicing in Hong Kong and China. So when I moved here about eight years ago, um, I have to relearn essentially the whole system 
when I decided to do my qualifications, I decided to do it all in one go and managed uh, in, 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 in a six month period to do my parts uh, one, two and three. So it was baptism by fire through uh, ARB prescribed exam, um, which I, so I can, I can uh, empathize with uh, some, of, some of the situations that we, we're gonna be discussing. Um, uh, since I qualified, I've been uh, trying to help other students who, who also struggled a bit with the format and the um, really quite, quite vague, sometimes vague criteria uh, of the exam and trying to kind of find their way through that. So I've, I think I've assisted some, somewhere between a dozen or 15 students through that uh, now so, and, and getting a relatively good idea of how, how things are evolving in, in the day and age and, and trying to kind of find a foothold in, in, in getting that exam right. I'm very happy to be here and very uh, grateful to, to Sarah for inviting me. Well, thank you for joining. Um, I, you know, it's, it, it's kind of a conversation that, you know, most people avoid. Um, it, it's kind of like um, nobody really wants to commit or to give their opinion on 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 the material or on the process. So it's it's really great to have you. Um, and just very quickly, um, I'm very curious to know, you know, people who have um, looked at um, a range of, 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 of portfolios and, and, and material, what in your opinion and what you have seen, what are the things that people struggle with the most um, in their submissions? Um, quite a few of the uh, students that approach me, they are generally already practicing in London or in, in architecture in the UK. So what they have to compare it to is actually quite a lot of information from their peers and quite a lot of them are already tra themselves trained in the UK. I think the hardest thing to come to terms with is that the uh, threshold for achieving part one and part two is quite unlike what uh, students in the UK themselves would have attained by part one and part two. And, and that tends to uh, throw people off quite a lot. I think it's uh, there is a suspension of this belief that needs to take place to understand uh, um, that this is a very different route and we will, uh, any students will do whatever it takes to, to, to achieve it. Yes, I, I totally agree. Um, I think having worked in my previous practice and having seen part one students freshly out of uni um, and you know their level of understanding and, and knowledge, um, I thought, well, you know, how hard could this be? Um, but as you said, it's not very comparable. And the, the criteria, criteria for the ARB prescribed exam seem to be on a level that is a little bit different. I think um, it's um, just important to clarify one thing. I, di I didn't want to make it sound like it's um, especially difficult. I don't think that's really the, the, the right mm -hmm. way of um, phrasing it. Um, it's, that is very precise that there's a very specific way they want to see it, a specific way they want to review it. And, and that um, kind of poses a, an, an additional dimension to the threshold you, you have to achieve. I think that's what it is. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just about the material and the depth of material, but it's also about how you present it uh, and, and how you make it accessible for a group of people to have a look at in one hour. Um, and, and the body, as you said, of, and the depth of, of the knowledge is very difficult to encapsulate in that package that is easy to just get. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much, Caleb, once again. And uh, Louis, uh, you know, the floor is yours. Uh, please tell us a little bit more about yourself, about your experience, and um, we're excited to hear from you. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice, Sarah, for inviting me to this um, event. And uh, nice meeting you, Caleb, for like joining us uh, also to comment the work I've been producing. So I, first of all, um, I'm originally from Colombia, as Sarah was mentioning. I'm an architect there, and I moved to the UK 
about eight years ago. So I wonder if I have, I'm able to share the screen now. So we can start with the presentation I have prepared um, for this session and we can start uh, seeing some work. So I want to also comment uh, that yesterday we have the London session uh, that was sponsored by Narrative Practice together with HFM Architects. And it was a really a successful event in terms of getting people together to kind of like team up, creating study groups, exchanging information and get the first assessment in terms of for the next, next workshop. So please uh, be in touch with us. We want to move forward with these uh, spaces that will enable you to create the information, know about the changes of the prescribed examination and uh, other uh, useful information in terms of how getting ready. So this initiative started uh, similarly as Sara did uh, the roadmap to recognition from the threshold, as Caleb was mentioning, of not of being already working through the UK, uh, studying in the UK, but not being able to register, is where we reflected about that different path that we are going through, and that is completely different from everyone else that study all their career in the UK and the difficulties that we have in terms of finding information, reaching out to people, um, and gathered information uh, uh, as a whole. So that's how I got in contact with Sara in terms of uh, the series that, uh, that was provided in YouTube by Nottingham Derby Society of Architects and that initial project, and also about my interest in terms of getting that forward and see how many people we can assist and support in order to create and balance uh, these, uh, all of the candidates in terms of uh, the, the industry. As you might notice, most of, uh, most of the architects who move to the UK, even though they, they are practicing, they might have a different, um, for example, in terms of salary range, position, or opportunities that uh, are quite different for those one who study here. And it it's, doesn't stop there. It's also about how difficult it gets to actually to register uh, following this path. So the, what we want to do is mitigate that, assist, and we welcome everyone to these events uh, moving forward. And we hope that this uh, enables you to be able to get to registration in that's your commitment. And also just to gather the information and be aware of all the procedures that you require before sitting the prescribed examination, because we uh, also we want to prevent people to submit the prescribed examination and ultimately fail which does about 50% of people who, who, according to the ARB previous survey, is about that range, uh, range that people fail. So- uh, Sorry, sorry, Luis, um, are you uh, sharing your screen? Not at the moment, yeah. I was, okay. <laughs> I was about right. just to start sharing the screen. So, uh, right, perfect. So, Again, uh, this is the second workshop that, and this is the third session from this series. So we started with the uh, combined the roadmap to recognition with this International Architects Collective. So the introduction about myself, uh, this, uh, again, I'm a Colombian architect. I've been working in abroad and in the UK. These are some of the projects I have been uh, doing over my uh, work experience and a little bit more about kind of um, the processes for example so if you uh, this diagram what i uh, what i what it illustrates is my own career path that could be similar to some of you uh, that move in the uk so you might have studied five years uh, overseas that automatically 
enables you to register as an architect in some countries such as Spain, uh, India, other places in Latin America. But once I arrived to the UK in 2015, I realized that coming from that background, the actual system is different in terms of part one, part two, part three that most of you uh, might be familiar with. So what you can see in this diagram is the, uh, the most important thing is the length of the architectural education, which is shown in blue. Uh, and in comparison with someone who studied here in the UK um, in terms of what is being shown in gray. So once I moved into the UK after having five years of, uh, um, of education and a couple of years of experience, it's getting into the track of what, how is the system here? And because we have an uh, overseas qualification, most of employers uh, are not aware about the procedures that you need to get to registration. They might consider you as a part one or uh, although they should be considered you uh, as a part, part two, depends on your education. And then, um, it's important to notice that sometimes what all what you need is to complete your part three in order to get that understanding of the system in terms of uh, what is the ARB, what is the RABA, what is uh, the relevant bodies in terms of planning applications, building control, uh, CDM, etc., and all the legal side that it will be what is the difference between the education from overseas and the UK in terms of, uh, for example, design aspects, uh, urban analysis, is I will consider those transferable skills. Uh, most of us in our education system, we went through uh, some projects that we selected a site that it wasn't in, it wasn't in our countries, for example. And that's the way most of, uh, many practices do that they have sites uh, around the world so it's something to acknowledge that we should be able to have those transferable skills in terms of um, what once you uh, do the prescribed examination and that's the threshold in where we are at the moment in how to demonstrate that we are able to to justify that process that we did from our education overseas. And what, what is marking green is all of the attempts in terms of, I, ha I, I haven't submitted, but it's all the, all the times that I have uh, get myself into the idea of submitting, reading the information in terms of this is the time, I have some time, then getting to read all the, a guidance and then most of you will find that it's kind of a difficult process just by yourself so i this is my fourth time in terms of like actually getting it done and this is the closest i've been to the submission so I, i'm very satisfied in terms of like actually being able to share the experience and obviously the support with uh, of people who has reached me out in terms of showing portfolio, showing information and sharing the experience. So moving forward, uh, you will see, you'll find yourself in terms of other career paths. You might done other disciplines, interior design, urban design, then you did a master in architecture in the UK, part three, and then you want to register and then you have to do the prescribed examination. Similarly, if you did part one here, then you decided to use your masters in the US, Australia, Hong Kong, in the EU, and then you have to validate that, even though you thought that studying outside might be a really good idea. And then most of people has the case that they study five years abroad, which uh, according to the ARB is, uh, is equivalent to a part two level, and then get into registration. So it will be two times the prescribed examination. So um, something important that, I think I discussed with Sarah at some point is that she asked me why did I decide why I decided to do my part three. So at the beginning, because I wasn't sure of my of where I was in my career path, I 
decided to retake my part two. And although it was a very useful type of approach in terms of learning new skills, et cetera, actually the information I was looking to learn was the part three level course. So once I completed the part two, I realized that yes, it was useful in terms of like learning new skills, getting a different perspective of education in terms of like a critical thinking, design, et cetera. That but, was with the Bartlett, was it? Yeah, so I did my master's, uh, uh, the second master's at Greenwich University. After complete, uh, due to the circumstances of, uh, you know, like uh, coming from overseas, the fee is slightly different as an international student. I did a part-time course and also uh, to kind of like balance that out. And then I thought that immediately would be the equivalent, et cetera. That's one of the learnings from this experience. Actually, I would say that what I was looking was the part three course instead of redoing the part two. Valuable experience in terms of networking, et cetera. Uh, again, like learning new skills, but the part three was in that moment where I, I, I should have looked much more into, uh, into detail. Now they, they have allowed certain courses to take without the prescribed examination. They are lecture courses only. Um, you can also do your case study. But essentially is, is understanding what is the legislation, how are the contracts here, and the implications of, of practicing as an architect, because that's essentially the, the gap when you move from one country to another, or the legal system, rather than the actual design skills, how to do a drawing, how to use CAD. That's, that's where that many people is very confident of or, or the design skills. So the next sec section will be about mapping the projects against the criteria. So I, I would like to share a little bit more of kind of like this combined uh, document that we have created with Sarah. So as a, a, at the beginning, it will be, it, it was reading the latest criteria that you find at the top. So from that latest criteria, uh, because it's a document in terms of it's not very graphically, uh, it, it doesn't graphically explain what and uh, how you should meet the criteria. Uh, there was a, a color-based format that some previous candidates had submitted uh, the prescribed examination. And we went a little bit forward into defining how this criteria move, will move across and meet the criteria, uh, meet the uh, the information uh, according to the color. So, just a little bit of a disclaimer: this is our own interpretation of the criteria, and this is something to point out. We don't know how the criteria was organized uh, directly from the ARB but we can already anticipate in terms of what type of information they are expecting in, at it, each level. So going into this middle uh, diagram, the warmer colors will, uh, will, will go to the criteria that are related to the cre creativity side. So for example, history and theories, the fine arts, and the, the colder colors it gets, is much more technical criteria. The threshold in between, it's one that can, that they are transferable in a way uh, because uh, methods of investigation, analysis of the, of presence and, and roles in architect society would, would be part of either technic, uh, a little bit technical or it could be a little bit of the creation of the concept. Another thing that we wanted to kind of like find out if they could relate somehow to the RABA plan of works. For those ones who are not familiar with what is the RABA and the plan of works, is a, a schedule in which breaks down the process of a, of a project, any project, from inception to completion. So similarly, stages, I will say zero to two, will be within the first three criteria. What it related to planning, it will be criteria four, planning design, 
people's uh, criteria five, which is about people building an environment. And the latest stages will be much more technical design, will be, that will be the criteria that are eight onwards. Again, this is not a, a direct re re relation, it's much more about kind of like uh, helping you to understand what projects would, would be suitable for mapping certain criteria. And you will find that once you select the projects, most of your academic projects will be in within this side of the BART, uh, let's say one, two, four, five. Uh, and if you did a technical report at the university, it will be much more uh, in the latest stages. Or if you have a professional uh, project that you did stage four, five, it will be uh, kind of in this area of the criteria. So once I have that reflection of how I can visually understand the criteria, I mapped uh, the whole criteria by colors. So I will associate certain colors with certain criteria and that will help me to understand, for example, if I'm looking at the urbanism analysis, I know that is this one, I will go through my own keywords um, summary that, that was very useful just to reduce the amount of word, words of the criteria into uh, simple phrases that will remind me what that criteria is about. But I will say, once you start typing your matrix, make sure that you are reading the whole document together because you might miss some useful information that is necessary to use uh, once you are typing the, the, um, the, um, the, the criteria. And then I move forward to, to start mapping all the all the projects i selected at first with the in the in the matrix in the comparative matrix this one is given by the arb with some uh, parts that are edited uh, which is the color the color palette here at the bottom and the projects that i selected so in order to navigate to this one so you could recognize that what is marking green, it's the projects that meet the criteria and I have the information of that project. And the ones that are in red is the ones that could meet the criteria, but because of some reason, I either don't have available material at the moment or I might need to complete a little bit. And this is very important because I did complete my first uh, architectural degree in 2013, so almost 10 years ago. And back then, I didn't know how to file properly, or I don't know where is my laptop, the hard drive. All of these things is something to consider because you want to avoid making the information again. So that's how I started to understand, like, actually, I have these projects that will meet most of the criteria, the ones that are with the full dot, uh, and the ones that I might consider to complete, it, it goes into like this threshold. So even though I selected eight projects that by the guidance, that's the maximum you will be able to submit, actually, uh, I'm covering most of the criteria only with four. I might include it at number five. But again, it depends on like accessibility or the additional project I'm considering to add. It's one from my previous employer and they haven't come back with me with their uh, reference. So that's just a simple reason why not to include a certain projects. And at the same time, you want to reduce the amount, amount of information and uh, amount of work that is needed because only with these ones, it has already taken me quite a lot of time. So once I did that, I started typing why that project would meet the criteria with the same summary I have. And I started to, to just uh, create in my own, my own reference to why each project would be suitable and, and understanding what I need to demonstrate in the, in the portfolio in the portfolio. 
And then after that, uh, the selection of the information, understanding from all of the information I have, what is actually relevant, how I will present it, how I will organize the projects, how many essays, my thesis, my, the technical report, the case study from part three, which projects from Colombia, uh, the professionals, the competition. So gathering even just by using, for example, tools like Miro, about having all of the information, having an overview of what is that project about, how relevant each pages were, and that easily make me realize that some projects weren't worth to include. And that's that's it in terms of the selection of the projects. I don't know if we should open for some questions at this space before, or if you would like to ask me some questions before we move forward. Yes, uh, Caleb, if you if you have any comments on the on Lewis's uh, process, uh, please feel free to comment. I just had a quick question, Lewis. Um, the the work that you had just shown was that your internal study, or was that part of any of your submissions? So you mean this? Or, or any of the pages uh, prior? Yeah, so this is part of the, for example, this is the one of the selected projects, for example, and this is the part of the process on typing the, why that project meets the criteria. This is even the same words I use in the form, for example. I understand now, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks. Right, is anyone? Um, just a quick yeah. comment um, uh, from me. I think it's great that you went through, you know, yeah. I instead of starting straight away to just produce material, I think that's a very important exercise uh, to do before you get started doing anything. Just um, taking the time to assessing the material you already have and the gaps that you already have and mapping everything against the criteria and being extremely organized. Um, I think that's extremely important. Um, and, um, and yeah, and well done for doing that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to start. Lewis, can I, can I expand on one of the uh, questions that are in our chat at the moment by Stephanie? Yes. She's asked, can all the selected projects be just professional projects and no academic ones? Um, just could you go back to the, the, the eight, eight projects you did analyze and just let us know which ones uh, or, or the proportion yes. of professional versus academic? Uh, Thank you. That's, a, that's actually a very good question, Stephanie. So the ARB requires that at least two of your projects are uh, done in academia and are, and are uh, from your own design, because sometimes in depends what you study, the module is done collectively. So you might end up being in a team in university, analyzing a site, doing an urban design, and then you do a part of a module. So that's something to take in consideration. It's best to submit at least two of the projects from academia, whether it is the UK and if you study here, I know one from uh, back home. So for example, that was, was one of the reasons I decided to, to start working on project four because I, I didn't submit, I, I wasn't uh, getting anything ready from, from Colombia and I was only providing the information from my latest studies in the in March two and part three and also professional experience here. So after having a conversation with uh, one of the prescribed examiners, uh, someone I, I know from um, the University of Greenwich, he advised that it best just to show at least one because at the end of the day, you, you are mentioning across the whole application that you study overseas. So it's important to cover yourself in terms of like, this is my project of, um, back home and also I have all of these ordered supportive materials. Lewis, can I can I just raise one point um, and this is obviously just um, my, my opinion. I, I really appreciate this particular slide because I think that is the first exercise for every a student looking to uh, take this route. Mapping, mapping and choosing the right project. 
And um, I, I think m most of us would probably want to approach these exams uh, very pragmatically anyway. So um, I don't think it would be um, too jarring to say that really what we're trying to do is pick the ones that tick the most boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to maximize the impact of uh, the projects that we would choose to, to, to invest in and, and to develop. Um, and that goes hand in hand with uh, what Lewis mentioned in terms of um, which of the projects you would actually want to spend more time in order to make more diagrams or uh, make more uh, three three dimensional uh, iterations in order to demonstrate uh, some of the particular criteria. Um, on, on the other hand, I I would hesitate to um, suggest that uh, it needs to show a full breadth of your uh, you know architectural life from from day one. I think picking the right and most comprehensive projects would be uh, pragmatically the most sound uh, thing to do, whether it be all in the UK because you did your part two in the UK and subsequently practice in the UK, likelihood is you'll find that your UK projects are pragmatically the best ones to choose uh, to, to meet the criteria for any number of reasons, it, the, 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 not the least of which your examiners would be able to relate to them uh, the most. That's my opinion. Yeah, and that's actually that. That's another reason why uh, most of the information is related to the UK projects, because uh, essentially, for example, the technical report in my masters is the one uh, project one is the one that has uh, ticked most of the criteria. Uh, now it's a question of like arranging it to the format. The information is there. My my. Uh, is about completely rephrasing, but it will be the one that you will be, uh, I was able to easily map across the criteria. And also uh, think about that once you have selected the projects, you can complete part of the criteria with those ones that, uh, for example, in terms of the points, uh, this is another um, information that is very useful. It's about how many points, for example, your project will cover. So you could you could have like a, each project could have a maximum of thirty three because each criteria has a, a divided in three in three sub criteria, and then they will usually review the the one that has them that ticks all of the criteria, and then you want to make sure that you cover that criteria at least three times. So this is a this is the times that, that for example I'm covering criteria one, criteria two times I'm covering criteria two. So you might select a project that covers the areas that you feel that you don't have enough, enough information. For example, the criteria that are much more difficult or no, I wouldn't say more difficult. Is it, I will I will rephrase that into summarize that criteria or demonstrating the criteria will be criteria two and three, which is about fine arts and history of theories, because most of the time you do essays for those. So what I would suggest is even though you would, you might want to submit an essay, which is a great idea, also make sure that you cover that information by adding an additional page just to reflect on the information of the essay, or you might need to create the information from zero. And that's where it takes additional time because that's, we are used to covering those subjects or so those criteria by writing uh, essays or theses. Uh, just a quick one to add to um, the point that Caleb made. The first criterion states that um, the graduate will have the ability to prepare and present building design projects of diverse scale, complexity, and type in a variety of contexts using a range of media, etc. So those are, you know, those are um, the, the cr criteria, let's say, of, of your projects. They need to be of diverse scale, complexity and type and in a variety of contexts. So 
uh, as you said, Caleb, and I, I, I would agree, as long as those projects um, do that, then you're fine. Right. Is there maybe any other questions in the question box? I'm muted. I think Karina is asking about some uh, examples uh, to uh, reference templates, and I think we will see um, examples of Lewis's work in the next slides. Karina, um, Josh is asking. It might be a case of selecting a project or projects that would fulfill a certain section of criteria completely and then moving on rather than trying to extend it across more. I, I think that's right, Josh. I think, um, yes, selecting projects with like the most overlap, I would say that's the best, um, that's the best strategy. Um, and because trying to extend the project to cover all the criteria would be a very time consuming. Yeah, correct. Yes, that's that's why it's important to start by the selection of the projects. So in yesterday's workshop, that was the first, um, let's say, um, assessment for next workshop to complete this one, to select the projects, to understand what type of information, because it's, it takes time. Like I can, I can see like, for example, why so many people uh, defer into submitting and why I have deferred previously. Again, this is it's just uh, uh, many information to navigate from different times, from, from reading, etc. So <clears throat> moving forward, in terms of, uh, I, I would like to introduce briefly the projects I select selected at the end. So this is uh, Plaza San Francisco. It's a project I did in 2012 and 2013. That was my final year project in Colombia. Uh, the reason why I decided to, to choose is after getting the advice of presenting at least one of the projects uh, that I did from my previous education, even though I have covered all of the criteria from the ones in the UK, it's important to reflect on also criteria one, that you are able to, to, to create designs in different contexts. So I wanted to demonstrate that criteria uh, through this project and also show and reflect on how I will do this project differently. So this is the one that I'm currently working on. So you wouldn't see any um, examples for this at the moment. The second project I have chosen, it's a Sigiria for, for, a Fortress uh, that's in Sri Lanka. It was a project of the MRH divided in two, in two parts. One was the urban scale at the left-hand side and the other one was the building scale of the right-hand side. So the project, um, because of the module, it moved, it moved very quickly from one scale to another. So uh, I almost kind of divided into two projects, but I have to present like a brief summary of what was this project about. So someone reviewing this information will understand why they change and almost why they don't relate, even though they are in the same site. The third project I selected was my uh, last year project from the master. So the project is called Abi Ayala, and the project is about indigenous people in the Amazon rainforest. This project was uh, nominated by the University of Greenwich for the RABA silver medal. So this was a very interesting to project to work on, but at the same time, because of the way I presented and also uh, the information um, I decided to do like, in different background, etc. Like for example, I use a, a black background for my portfolio. Once I started to organize this portfolio, I realized that uh, most of the information from this project needed a lot of addition. So I have to let go of many of my design work just for the practicality of creating the portfolio for the prescribed examination, the, uh, the quickest and the less uh, time consuming. 
And the last project I selected was the uh, work portfolio, uh, work uh, professional project that was my case study for uh, the Bartlett. And again, this one, it was to cover much more the criteria from eight to 11, which is the, about professional aspects, uh, functionality, engineering, services, uh, et cetera. Construction, procurement, and going forward. So I would like to show you kind of like a comparison in terms of the portfolio I submitted for my master's uh, for project uh, for the first uh, year four of master's. So this is the whole pages. It's about 50 pages for this portfolio. Um, and also you can see that part of the information, the pages is a drawing with a key, not much of a text, maybe a full page of a 3D render, a diagram, etc. But then this is the this is the layout in which I accommodate part of the information. So these are two pages of the analysis of the historical context. So as you can see, uh, it, it is much more about demonstrating what information complies with the criteria. So for example, in terms of the historical context, I'm mentioning here uh, the history of the site because it's a, it's a archeological site that was used as a monastery, also as a palace and now is uh, for research. And then how, for example, the history of the site has influenced my, my design. So that's that kind of like demonstrating this information. I summarize at the bottom what criteria it covers and also something important. And I, and I wonder um, in terms of this page, even though I wanted to focus only in the historical context, I could see that there are other criteria that it will cover, such as um, the urban aspects and also methods of investigation, which is criteria seven. Uh, in the others, in the other page, is similarly uh, this was about urban analysis uh, only this page. And it was how, for example, my project that has as, as a brief, uh, the integration of a space elevator in Sri Lanka, how will affect the, the infrastructure of the whole country. It will become the center of the world if we, get, if we have such an infrastructure and how an archeological site where this project will be located uh, will be affected. That was the given brief of the unit, which is uh, quite interesting in terms of the challenges of integrating a high-end technological uh, um, building, such as a space elevator, into an archaeological site. So for someone reading this project, I have to summarize, uh, for example, what was given by the unit, why I did the, this project, and where, why the analysis uh, was taking me to the to that direction. So this was my, this was a, an example of how I will cover that criteria because of the analysis of the site, I could see that there was, for example, some infrastructure that I wanted to protect in terms of agriculture, um, reservoirs for animals, et cetera. So you can see here in this picture that there were elephants. And this was my approach into the, the, the design. So I needed to type that down. Like uh, this is what I found. And that's why I took the decision of doing uh, certain aspects of, on my design. This is project, uh, the last year project, uh, year five of the masters. This is a Via Yala project. And similarly, I did this one in the Amazon rainforest. Uh, my own interest was into research about indigenous people uh, and how the Amazon is being deforestated. But I, I went into, uh, into, into look at art and also indigenous hubs, et cetera, to kind of create 
a typology of architecture. So this is the way I presented that project with the urban analysis in terms of from patterns for, from their own um, motifs from, from objects they had and all other aspects in terms of, of explorations, in terms of testing ideas, collaging, rendering, modeling, all of that, even doing a physical model. <clears throat> and then com again, converting that into a page in which we'll talk about urban analysis, needs and aspirations from, for the design. So something I found by doing the prescribed examination portfolio, it's about, it, it was to make it very clear with the title, very clear with the words, what is that page about? Even though you will find that this page, for example, might cover some aspects of design, it was about understanding what were the needs from indigenous people from the, from the analysis of their, um, their own architecture and my own interpretation in terms of making that model from the elements and then recreate that. And again, how that influenced my design. And I think that was the main question to ask all the time while you are doing these pages. From all of this information, what, what is what you are taking forward and how, how that is being uh, taken in consideration uh, in terms of brief, in terms of aspirations, in terms of uh, design of the building, etc., and making it clear uh, once you type that information. Um, I wonder if uh, you you have any questions prior moving forward. Um, Caleb, do you have any comments? I have a couple of comments, but I'll I'll wait for you to go first. I'll just make a couple. I, I really appreciate it, um, that Lewis, and thanks for thanks for talking us through it. I'm sure um, our audience would be uh, brimming with uh, questions as well. I, I think you, you make a really important point about being very precise about exactly what each of the points you want to make are. One of the most frequent questions I get from students is, am I really limited by 80 pages? There's 80 pages things started floating around, I think, at some point. Uh, some of my friends who took it years before me told me not to worry about it because uh, they put together a 100-page document with 300 pages of appendices. I definitely saw those. Um, and, I, and I ultimately went in with well beyond 80 pages my, myself. So um, I, I'm not one to preach. But the, the precision of the language actually is helpful uh, for the larger picture. The larger picture being after you submit this, you have to defend it. And the defense of it actually is more challenging because they ask you point blank, what is this point? And you actually have to refer them to a page. And you have to refer them to the pages and give them the points in a very short sentence. Uh, being able to distill it on paper in advance helps one immensely when you get to that point. Uh, ideally, of course, you don't get to that point. They take it off the, 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 the list and then they never ask you that question. But inadvertently, I think, um, as, as Lewis, with very, very, you know, elongated experience with this now, would probably have experienced uh, some of the points tend to get asked all the time, mostly out of interest, if, if nothing else. So uh, on, on the precision of the, the page and the language, um, Lewis, if, if you don't mind, just uh, go into the page previous. That, that was a very helpful page, I thought. There are some points that this are worth... Or... Uh, th that, that one, exactly. Or, or this one would be perfectly fine as well. 4.1, 4.2, 4.3. A lot of that depends on theory. And theory is very hard to explain with diagrams. So if there were very precise points to make, exactly which theory you're referring to, a theorist you're referring to, it usually comes in the form of a short paragraph on that page. Uh, I, I wouldn't even hesitate to put a 4.1 uh, as, as um, Lewis has very colorfully tagged onto the page, onto the paragraph. That's, that's one of the suggestions that I, I make and, and continue to, to make for my students. Right. 
So, uh, okay. yeah, sorry, Luis, about this page. Um, yes, no, absolutely. That's the way to go, in my opinion. Just exactly in the titles, use the words of the matrix in your titles so that they're easy for the uh, jury to refer to. And that's exactly what you've done. Um, just on that first page, would it be possible? Because I'm seeing quite a bit of text and I do I, I appreciate that this is the historical context and there's a lot of uh, narrative. Um, but would it be possible to show maybe a, a map of how the site has evolved so that you can reduce uh, the text a little bit? So show different maps uh, of how the site evolves, evolved through time. And then ho like hopefully that will help you to reduce the text a little bit because there's quite a bit to read on both pages. Um, and I'm just afraid that you know that that the information will be missed and um, I, mean, I i appreciate that comment uh, because that's kind of like i uh, in terms of developing developing the information i also realized that for example once i type the information on the criteria and type the information in terms of this page is about it takes another step forward into making that a paragraph that I wrote into a diagram, and it's in the in in this space which I am uh, in making the portfolio, is reviewing it back and forward on onto specifically that, and again that's another layer of information to produce because you might find yourself that most of the most of the time uh, the portfolio we show we pin up in a crit, we explain it an image, and we talk about that information. But there is not enough information in terms of how was that recorded, how was a diagram, etc. And that's the additional information that I, I can see from different examples, from even doing my own prescribed examination portfolio. That's the additional part that it needs to be created from scratch. And I will advise to everyone listening is that. Uh, get ready to reflect a lot in your projects. It's very interesting to see your project from a different perspective, like a couple of years after, and, and actually seeing that, oh, I remember this present I was looking at. I don't have any analysis. That was the first thing I, I, I could notice that, that I could cover many criteria, but I didn't left any information about that single piece of information. And I have to create it because of covering the criteria. And again, about the text, I completely agree. And this is one of the things I, I need to allow myself some time to do it because it's simple for us as architects to visually see some information rather than going through, through images. And that's why also submitting essays, submitting full case studies, it needs to be covered by some type of diagram, some type of um, illustrative and graphic information to enable someone to go through, especially in one hour. And that's, my, and that's an important key to, to have. Yes, absolutely. And, it, and I know how hard it is when you finish a page and you've spent so much time on it and you're like, ah, it, this graphically looks beautiful. And then somebody else comes along and says, well, there's too much text or this is not clear or your point isn't coming across and you have to let go of, of all of that, uh, you know, work that you put together. Um, and I've struggled with that, trust me, um, a lot. Um, the other point that I wanted to raise, you know how you've put historical context and then you've put the, the red dots that, that refer to historical context and then you thought, oh, well, actually this covers this as well. I don't know what you think, Caleb, about this, but for me, um, if you are covering uh, 7.1 and 7.3 extensively somewhere else, I wouldn't put it here. Right. Because it, it just, yes, I, I mean, there's a lot of overlap between criteria. There, there, there will be. Um, but just to be 100% clear, this is the historical context 
these are the criteria that I'm, that I'm covering. And if you can put 7.1 and 7.3 in other parts that are more, you know, targeted towards that, I think that would be better. And that is only obviously if you have that much material that covers those criteria. What do you think, Caleb? Um, so I, I, I agree uh, to the extent that um, the, the clarity is, is, the, is really the, the purpose of this entire exercise. If the intent was to talk about GC2 and the reality is 2, 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3, they are all very different points um, that the examiners are trying to get at. Um, it, they do seem like they should have one page devoted to that specifically it would be um it, it would mean that the page is covering too much if it also touches upon 7.1 7.3 and 4.2 in my opinion on some of the other kind of uh, pages for example if you're talking about design and it happens to have uh, a discussion on structural configuration where you can touch on gc8 i, I would find that those are more appropriate because uh, one is vague and one is targeted so it really does depend, I, I believe, on the general criteria. Yeah, so, so this is what I probably would advise uh, my students, that uh, things like GC2, 3, 4, uh, and probably the, the very later ones like uh, 9, 10, 11, those are the ones where a lot of devotion needs to be put onto it and therefore probably warrants its own page. Right. That's a very good advice because um, that's something I've been actually rearranging. Kind of like, it's interesting to go through different layouts, different way to present, just like by seeing, for example, now uh, I'm reformatting some of the pages just to make it very clear about one specific criteria. And it's kind of like about the process into realizing that even though it, the criteria overlaps, it's better just to make clear that one page is about this criteria only and let go the other criteria for another pages. Uh, yes, that's, that's kind of the process in which um, I'm going through at the moment and it's very helpful this advice, especially uh, getting myself ready before submitting, of course. Lewis, uh, and uh, Sarah, I apologize if, if uh, you were going to a different point or, or on a similar point. I, I just thought um, Atticus' uh, question in the chat was, was quite relevant here too, especially this page about uh, th theoretical essays in support of things like 2.1, 3.1 to some extent, and definitely 4.1, uh, how to bring that into uh, the portfolio, especially since it's like so recommended to be in a graphical format. Lewis, how did you approach that? So, uh, at, so currently it's, at the moment I just have it in terms of the um, essays. And again, it's, creating a diagram for that essay into a page. So that's something I'm working on after getting this advice from my previous revision with Sarah, because it's what, it was something that it was very dense. Um, something to, to mention is that Sarah's portfolio is online through the NDSA and she covered that information very clear. Uh, for example, she has a historical essay and also two pages about how, uh, for example, the city has changed or like certain um, analysis of the policies, etc. And you, you understand it once you, you know that the essay covered that and you, you almost see the two pages of the portfolio with the essay and it talks about the same the same criteria, but the one is much more easy to navigate just by looking the diagrams. So I would recommend to have a look into those. Uh, yes, to, to uh, answer, uh, I was uh, um, going to um, bring up Atika's question because I think it's very, very relevant as well. Um, so my personal opinion, what I, what I did, um, it was, um, 
having the essay related to the project. Why? Because um, I wanted to keep keep the projects, not confuse the jury with too many projects, too many things to look at, and have that build um, that that theoretical part of the project build into the brief of the main project. Um, and as Lewis is Lewis said, I try to write the essay and have the essay, but have a couple of pages in the actual portfolio with diagrams summarizing the essay and referring to it uh, for uh, ease of navigation. Um, so I, I don't know, Atika. All I can tell you is that I try to relate the theoretical essays to the projects. Caleb, what do you think? It, it, the, the, tying it in with a project that you're also expanding on on other points is and, and would remain very strong simply because the bigger a story you can tell, the more you keep the, the examiner engaged. I, I think that would be one of my priorities. In order to bring it into the portfolio, what I had done was dedicate a page or half a page with some screenshots of the essay that I did write uh, and highlight particular points within it that I think tick the box. I, I sort of went to maybe a bit too thorough on some of these things because um, you, you just create work for yourself. But uh, I did try to summarize particular points and then I also in the appendix of having attached a full essay, tagged uh, the essay with the points that I think it ticked. So 4.1, 4.2, even 4.3 to some extent, for example, in an urban essay, uh, something like that. So uh, there, there's a, a number of ways, but I think uh, everything is really at your disposal. You want people to understand that you did write that and that there were some main points in there that you would consider relevant. Right. Fine. Um, I wonder if the, we should move into Q&A or... Um, did you want to show a bit about um, your you case want... study? Yes. Or... I can yeah, show... so let's do that and then we can answer questions as we go because I think there is a question about professional work. Um, so that's, that's, that was quite relevant to this section. Um, Josh is asking, would you recommend on limiting the criteria reviewed slash explored per page? Um, not necessarily, but um, as Caleb mentioned, um, if you are talking about historical context and you want to put your point across, um, depending on the context, maybe don't mix too many criteria in the same page, um, just for ease of navigation and of clarity. But I would say definitely I mixed criteria in pages, uh, just depending on relevance. Um, but yeah, it's just the point is things need to be extremely clear. So um, moving forward with the uh, case study and professional project. So this is the first page and this is just an extract of some of the pages. Uh, the case study was about 150 pages which uh, I will submit, but for this um, exercise, I have extracted the one that I have mapped uh, and amended. So the first cover page, I'm keeping it with the same template in terms of having the nodes of project three, which relates to the, the matrix, uh, and also the title, what is the project about, a conversion of an existing uh, four-story dwelling into four self-contained flats, the summary is a project that I did throughout my uh, professional studies. Uh, I worked on that over three to three years, four years, and I was the person responsible for the delivery of the project uh, on behalf of the, of, of the practice. <clears throat> so I mentioned that clearly. So in terms of the perspective that I have and the brief of the information, I wasn't very much involved into the design. So I, I had this project from a stage four onwards. So the next pages was much more about a criteria tracker and kind of like having 
links, hyperlinks, because I'm already thinking in terms of this will be review online or it will be review in a computer likely. <clears throat> so how they can navigate into a document that is 150 pages and going to the specific page that I want them to review certain criteria. So that's another skill to have. I have to kind of like remind myself how to do this. And then in terms of making sure that certain criteria is covered, I found that the criteria is spread across different pages. So the first thing I did was to mention that even though this hyperlink list, most of the criteria, they, uh, it's highly recommended that to go through most of the document to see other places that I have also mentioned it. And then a brief explanation about how this document was created is a section of three, it's a, it's, it's a portfolio of three documents and I'm only presenting section two and how the layout was created and was, what was the new addition or addition in terms of um, for the prescribed examination. So I add in a gray box with the, with the dots in terms of saying where the criteria is met. So some of the pages, for example, in terms of professional criteria, I'm in the page, I'm talking about architects' employment and how the appointment will affect the employment, uh, the, the, um, the amount of people, how to manage the practice with the project. And uh, in terms of procurement, uh, I marked the criteria 11. And then in the next one that, this is to do with a structural design and, and cost analysis, uh, how, how the design was reviewed uh, according to the cost of the project. So there was a phase in which uh, the project was uh, by client decision uh, kept with existing structure, but actually we suggested that it was best in terms of performance and in terms of speed that all the most of the interior was demolished and this this uh, page talks about considering cost into the design so that's criteria 10.2 but also it covers about understanding of a structural um and structural concepts uh, into the design um into 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 the design uh, another page covers about building control. So discussing about my involvement in terms of the, uh, the process. I, this is about health and safety, which is the criteria 10.3, considering other aspects of, of the, the legal aspects in the, in the UK and the performance standards of health and safety. And this is the example selected for like this um, review. <clears throat> yes, I think that's um, that's great. So, so uh, just so that I understand, the areas highlighted in red are the ones that are relevant to the criteria, right? The, the ones, so no, the ones that are highlighted in red are the ones, is the critical analysis of my own experience while I did my part three. I wonder if it was the same in other schools. Uh, so the reflection of the process. So that's the commentary of my, of how to improve the process of health and safety in my practice for this project back then. And that's, the essentially what they should be reading if they if they read part of this document but also here i'm summarizing what criteria it covers and also the titles i didn't amend too much in the case study because i i believe it's the layout is very clear for someone to navigate mm -hmm. the difficulty i found is that as it that continuous document that it develops and the conversation goes from page to page. So for example, if there was an issue 
of a delay of a planning application, uh, the construction might get delayed. And then you might talk a little bit more about planning and how that affects the design, the cost, et cetera, in page probably 50 something. But you started talking about planning in page 20. So that's where uh, kind of like thinking about how someone will navigate is something to uh, be clear once you are preparing the documents. And also depends on the document that you are presenting, especially the case study, if you have done your part three, an essay, there will be different ways of presenting it. As Kayla mentioned, uh, you did pages and then you talk about uh, those specific bullet points. I decided to do it by hyperlinks, but it's taking me much more time than I thought. So, I don't, there is no, I, I guess there is no right or wrong direction as long as someone is able to navigate to the document. Sarah, I wonder if it's um, also useful to consider it from the point of view of some students who um, may not have done the case study uh, and then trying to fulfill the particular criteria. I think Lewis would probably agree if it wasn't for a case study having been done. Uh, approaching part one without a case study would make it, you know, twice as horrible. To address kind of Murtaza's uh, query here about professional work being teamwork, that, that tends to be um, one of the reasons why examiners have skepticism about you know, one's participation on the professional projects that you cite. Um, the, and the reason why the case studies from part three become sort of a free pass is you, you're forced to have ticked those boxes um, and, and have learned about those projects, despite the fact that you may not have played uh, what we call primary role uh, in that project. A lot of them are done by shadowing. Uh, learning from others uh, in, in, in the practice about those projects. Uh, but that is given a free pass because of how forensic it, it tends to need to be. It, it, the, 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 I don't think there is an, an easy answer to, to Matazo's question, but it tends to be that teamwork is uh, allowed, uh, but there's a kind of demonstration of your role in it that has to be quite clear. Um, what one tries to do in order to bias it in your favor is to uh, give uh, the impression of, of a very thorough understanding of, of that project and of the processes that uh, have gone on. I, I've had students who've led projects and still had no transparency as to what actually happened. For example, they were the project architect on, on a project. Uh, delivering it, delivered it, it's built and you can see it, but they didn't know what the uh, building control procedures were or how, how it happened. Uh, so so it, it's not that those two things are automatically linked. So I do believe it is possible that despite not playing a primary role and despite not necessarily having a case study, that you can still demonstrate a very thorough understanding of a project and everything that's that's in it. And yes, uh, yep, go ahead, Luis. No, I, I wanted to say like, uh, in this case, because I had my case study, yes, that's kind of like it covers, it immediately covers that criteria. But I also found that my, my technical report at my master's covers that criteria as well. And, and there will be some elements in terms of your education, even overseas of doing uh, technical aspects of a project, whether that's not called building control uh, in the relevant in those countries, it would be about understanding what's building control here. What do you do? What do you do? Uh, did abroad, and how would you do it here? And that's the part in which uh, maybe some candidates would like to explain, or also by providing professional work. Uh, or providing uh, other relevant information that will cover that criteria. But I think there is the, a variety of options in which someone could meet that criteria. The reason why I did this one is because I, is in a way, is, I'm 100% sure that cover is because that's what you cover in part three anyway. 
Uh, exactly. And, and more to say, if I might add, um, uh, if, if I were you, I would select the project that I have worked on the most. And I think there's no harm in going back, even say you, ha you haven't submitted planning, you could go back to these phases and comment on the process. Um, but um, uh, if you want a, a reference to this, uh, there is on our website, uh, Tanya has shared with us um, a report that she has done that compares the building regulations and the procedures here in uh, England compared to um, Ireland. Uh, and she has done this essay to, 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 to draw that comparison uh, to, um, uh, sub, uh, to uh, cover some of those professional criteria. So if you go and refer back to that essay from Tanya, that will give you some insight about how to, to do that sort of comparison in order to be able to cover that sort of criteria. Right. Um, I wonder if there is more questions or we should open the microphones in terms of further questions related. To uh, yes, we, we have about um, uh, 10 minutes left. I'm conscious of time. Uh, if you have any more questions, uh, please, uh, you can just unmute yourself and, and ask them or you can put them in the chat. Um, also, um, Louis, while this is uh, happening, uh, did you want to speak a little bit more about upcoming events and the collective and things coming up? Hey, yes, I wonder if maybe Drew is in the audience so we can talk about the next workshop together uh, and he could unmute himself. I am indeed, hello. Hello, hi Drew, thanks for joining us. So Drew uh, and I have been working to, uh, together into making this workshop in London. Also, we are kind of connecting uh, all the people involved and network in terms of NDSA, narrative practice, HFM, etc. So Drew is a director of narrative practice, uh, the, the project in there with this initiative is to create a workshop that enables people to start, enable people to exchange the ideas and, and uh, go through the process together. So part of my experience and my conversation with Sarah, uh, Caleb and Ruth is that we as architects usually get into a tutorial, exchange ideas, see someone else's work, and that's how we go through education. In comparison to this um, prescribed examination, uh, we find ourselves that we are alone, but actually you can see how many people have signed up, are being involved into the process, and there is more people that hasn't been able to join us, but they're still contacting us for suggestions. So I think these spaces are very useful for everyone just to see work if someone else wants to present in the future, um, meet with other candidates that are going through the same process, we would like to enable this space. So I leave to Drew to talk a little bit more about narrative practice and, and the coming events. Sure, thanks Lewis and Sarah and Caleb as well. I mean, this is always a really interesting conversation that as a home student, or someone that did their part one to three in the UK through the traditional route, um, you rarely hear. Um, and also I imagine that practices also rarely hear or know about. And so therefore it's fantastic to raise a little bit more awareness about this initially anyway. Um, just a little bit about the background of the mentoring thing, but, uh, but without the emphasis on it um, is that, over the pandemic, we initiated um, an in international mentoring scheme for those students who were left without institutions um, from underrepresented backgrounds from across the world. We held more than 250 sessions with 150 students across two years. Um, but now that we're settling back into this real world scenario, and especially um, as we um, are talking more about 
how we can make our professions more um, representative of our communities that we are designing for. We decided as HFM, uh, where I am associate and through narrative practice where I'd already set this um, up already, brought that into a real world scenario. Um, so, so far we've only been running for two months, but we've seen about um, 30 to 45 students um, and we've initiated men this mentoring process. Now, when Lewis approached me with this idea to uh, engage with the ARB prescribed examination, frankly, I didn't know much about it. Um, but slowly getting there and now having heard so much about it, it is very much akin to this um, part three process that you you go through here. However, um, the word I use is onerous. So yes, I agree, it's not more difficult, but it's just more involved. Um, and so what we're trying to do is set up monthly workshops and weekly, uh, sorry, monthly sessions essentially to help. Now, CVs is one thing that comes up quite a lot um, and is a part of the um, examination process. So immediately we can help in this scenario. So um, I'll come on to when and how. Um, the portfolio layouts and the portfolio um, discussions that you've had today are extremely useful, especially for myself but also then for Lewis and Sarah, uh, if if anyone or even Caleb would like to get involved with that side of thing from our mentoring side of things, I would happily offer you the space to be able to do that too, um, both physically and virtually. Um, and then the, this is where the students or the working professionals and the practice um, members and the community come in where you are having this hardship. And so what we're doing is offering ourselves. We're giving you anything and everything you want in terms of a network, in terms of a group conversation, in terms of um, just somewhere to speak, because that is the one thing that's completely missing. Um, and I've realized that it's a financial burden for everyone, essentially. It might happen once, it might happen twice. You've, you have to redo things. You have to ask for these conversations. I don't see why there has to be this barrier in place. So let's get rid of that. And this is one thing that we're doing. And then the second part is the guidance element, which is mentioned right at the start, Sarah. Um, about there being a lack of guidance and a bit of a lack of information that's already out there. So let's create that resource list and let's create these lecture series notes and um, essentially a bit of a new guidance strategy. Um, and again, we'd love to help in that as well. So um, in terms of dates, we held it. We held a live session um, in the first week of every month. Um, we've found that this is the most engagement. So that's that's the time when people are most available. So the next one is January the 6th, followed by February the 3rd. I haven't released the dates for March, but it will be most likely Thursday or Friday, first week in March again. And we're running this perpetually. Um, the idea is not just that it was meant to be for ARB um, ex prescribed exams, but also just for anyone in their career, part ones, home students, people in between, so everyone attends and we have spaces and we have um, 12 mentors at the moment who are able to help across multiple different things with lots of different experience. But um, And Lewis is one of them, of course. And so this is where his um, knowledge of uh, what he's going through comes in. Um, I realize I've spoken a lot there, but I just want to really um, emphasize the point that there is a system out there and there is a network for those students and professionals that are listening. Um, so please use us as much as possible. Um, otherwise, what we're doing is actually for nothing unless you engage with us. Um, so yeah, that's all. I'll leave that there. But um, yeah, fa fantastic to hear from um, everyone and, and, all, and all the comments as well. I think is that everything is really valuable. I hope uh, I, I can, I know this is being recorded, but uh, we should all be writing these things down and putting them into a big resource list as well and then sharing it with everyone. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, thank you, Drew. Um, mm. Thank you very much for uh, attending and thank you for your help and all that you're doing. Um, just um, so if, if people want to, to know more about these events, where can they find you? So um, the Instagram is narrative practice. Um, so everything is sort of uh, roots out from there. Um, the booking website is uh, hfm.uk.com forward slash sessions. I'll put that into the chat in a moment. Um, and yeah, and you can always contact me um, by any means. I mean, Instagram, so because everyone's in a in a social realm now, um, you can email me if you prefer to be a little bit more formal, and that's also okay. 
depends how you how you feel of contact. Thank you very much. And I would like to uh, remind everyone that we are starting um, a, a newsletter uh, here at uh, the Nottingham and Derby Society of Architects uh, that is um, specific to the ARB prescribed exams and to the events uh, that are being organized around the subject. So if you would like to be um, uh, included, please send us your email through our website. And uh, um, the plan is for Lewis uh, as well to uh, contribute to the newsletter so that we can uh, organize between us uh, events uh, in London, in Nottingham, and uh, also online. Uh, so yeah, uh, just uh, send us a message uh, and uh, we'll be happy to help. So, okay, um, conscious of time, uh, I will close the event then. Thank you so much, uh, Louis, for sharing your work. It's, it's, it's amazing um, that we are able to, you know, to, to see your work even before you, uh, you submit. Um, and uh, I wish you the best of luck. I have no doubt that you will succeed. Uh, thank you very much, Caleb, for being here with us. Your insight has been, you know, extremely useful. And I really hope that people have benefited. I'm sure they have benefited from the conversation. And thank you, Drew, um, for being here and for contributing to the initiative. All right. So um, I will close the event. Thank you all for joining. And uh, hopefully we'll ah. see you soon in the next event. Thank you. Hope to cross paths with, uh, with all of you in the future as well. So lovely to meet you. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Thank you, guys. Cheers, all. Bye bye.